On the European level, there are a couple of other structures that, uh, that coordinate um, uh, the idea of asylum and particularly persecution. So we have the EU directives, uh, which are binding um, instruments, although they're implemented by the states. So the directives are not binding in their, they're not directly applicable in the member states. They have to be put into national legislation. Um, but we have the reception conditions directive, which basically outlines settlement and, and ideas about um, what, the, what people who are applying for asylum are entitled to during their, uh, during their process. The qualifications directive, which outlines what a refugee is um, and discusses persecution in some, in some way. Uh, and the asylum procedures uh, directive. All of those are binding in EU countries and have done a lot to harmonize um, jurisprudence on, um, on uh, asylum, uh, asylum applicants. The EU regulation and regulations in the EU are directly applicable in their, in their textual articulation from the EU on states. Uh, the Dublin Declaration was in 2003, and you'll notice that preceded all of these directives, and there's a good reason for that. Um, harmonization in the EU was partly prompted by the fact that the Dublin Declaration made it difficult for people to pass through, uh, asylum applicants to pass through one state and go to another state and apply in the state that they landed. So, as I mentioned, France was very, uh, was very opposed to a broader version of um, the state actor idea for, for persecution. So France was rejecting a lot of claims from people who were abused by non-state actors. Um, so people knew that they had a better chance of you know, getting asylum in the UK. So that was one of the ways that, that the EU decided to push back on the idea of forum shopping by passing the Dublin Declaration, which made it you know, illegal to, or made it impossible for people to claim asylum in a second country once they've gone through one EU country. And we also know from the US that we have the safe country concept, so there are certain countries that if you pass through that country, you have to have applied for asylum in that country before applying in, in the US. And the EU has not only the EU Dublin rules, but also other safe countries that, um, that are on that list. So these are hurdles for asylum, asylum applicants. The directives um, helped at least to level the playing field a little bit. You know, um, on the more liberal side of interpreting uh, refugees and persecution a little more broadly. So there was some give and take, but the Dublin Declaration is very, very difficult, and it's, it's a big hurdle for, for uh, refugees in the EU. Then we have national implementing um, measures. The humanitarian protection in the EU case also includes um, the European Convention on Human Rights which uh, in Article 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights is the right not to be tortured or um, treated inhumanely, that really comes up a lot. I mean, it comes up sort of like the Convention Against Torture will come up in the United States for the purposes of humanitarian leave to remain um, outside of refugee protection in, in uh, the EU. And the sorting principle that is basically the principle of non-refoulement. Um, I always say that wrong, non-refoulement. I just said now we're not a problem. Uh, in, uh, in the European context, and that's just a court decision that reiterates the, the principle of, of Article 3 in the European Convention of Human Rights. So, um, I won't go through this whole thing, but this is the definition of persecution in the qualification directive in the EU, which includes um, sufficiently serious nature of uh, violation of its uh, human right. Um, let's see, sexual violence, legal, administrative, police, or judicial measures, which are themselves in, themselves discriminatory. Um, obviously, these aren't really extrapolated to, or, or what you can't get from this definition is the, the degree to which uh, the violence needs to happen, the severity, and that comes out in, in the jurisprudence. So this is a very general definition, but I won't go through it because it's, it's really context specific and the bar is quite high. Um, but it, it resembles a lot of what we've been talking about in terms of types of, of persecution that people um, can claim asylum for. So in general, persecution isn't really defined in the Geneva Convention. Um, the definition has been, has been seen as vague, quite flexible, and subjective. It's been quite open, especially in the EU, even after these harmonization um, uh, measures have come in. 
immigration equality has been one one organization that I've, I've noticed really tries to map out um, what the different types of persecution can look like and what we have to be aware of when making claims um, in terms of the severity to which that persecution needs to be proven in order to get the claim through. And the, the areas that they, they've outlined, <clears throat> and I've, I've changed them a bit um, for, for my presentation, uh, are serious physical harm, um, coercive or medical, uh, sorry, co coercive medical or psychological treatment, invidious pr uh, prosecution or disproportionate punishment for criminal offenses. And that has to be really, really high. The burden is quite high. As Neil mentioned, it's not enough that uh, a country outlaws um, same-sex sexual activity. The country has to actually enforce it and has to go significant step in making the person aware that there is going to be persecution in the future. Severe discrimination and economic persecution, that's an understatement as well. It needs to be quite severe and quite um, explicit and directed toward the individual. And the same with severe criminal extortion or robbery. So what I'll, go, what, what I'll do is go through those areas and kind of look at certain differences in what would probably likely be, be classified as persecution in that area and what might not. Um, it's quite dangerous to do this actually because it's a case by case decision and obviously these broad definitions are contingent upon lots of things. But in general, if someone were to have a basic discussion about persecution like this, it'd be good to at least have a, a, a vague idea of, of what some of the differences are in these types of claims. So, serious physical harm. Um, some of the main ones, rape, sexual assault, and other forms of gender and sexuality-based violence, um, including, uh, including against people who have an imputed gay identity. There was a good article by Joe, Joe Landau in the Fordham Law Review a few years ago about imputed um, gay identity and, what was it? And, uh, and soft immutability. And immutability is this idea that you can't change something, and that's what makes you part of a particular social group. And he looks at um, actually the Ninth Circuit and how the Ninth Circuit has decided on some of these issues um, and put people with imputed identity uh, in, in the category of um, particular social group, which has been very helpful. But those types of violence are, are kind of characteristic of the type of violence, um, the level of violence that, that has to be shown um, for persecution. Threats that cause psychological harm, and that and that's also sounds very vague, but um, threats alone that don't cause any, um, any recognizable harm, which I've put on the, on the right column, um, aren't part of what constitutes persecution. They can go to corroborate some sort of claim, but alone, it's not enough to um, to say that I was threatened, um, and that's that's part of my persecution. Jumping back to the left column, the, the the third thing is threats by a group that that had the will and the ability to carry out promises of violence. So, uh, a, a more in depth claim of future persecution, including some sort of argument and and a credible argument um, and probably corroborative evidence that the group that made the threat has the ability and the intention to carry out the threat. Um, that's when it, it, it probably will go toward a persecution um, argument that will be more likely successful than just a threat alone, which will not. And then violence against the applicant's family has also been, um, has also been the grounds for proving persecution uh, for the claimant. And the last thing on the on the right side is isolated instances of violence in a context that supports protection <laughs> against the violence. So if you're in a situation where um, you were beaten up uh, and called derogatory terms, it's not enough just to prove that that is persecution. There has to be either some sort of past practice, or there have to be there has to have been um, so, sort of the tolerance on the side of law enforcement. And these things all go to prove that it's something that can happen again, and it's something that. Um, uh, either proves past, past practice or future persecution. Um, one isolated incident is usually not enough to, to prove it, even though there are other circumstances where it could be enough. So again, these are kind of vague outlines of some of the issues that come up with the physical harm um, claims for persecution.